This is Resonance 104.4 FM. I'm Nick Hedigan. How you doing? And welcome to another slice of literary London from, well, London. Um, and you may be able to hear from the, the background noise that I'm not in the studio tonight. Now my little possums. Ah, oh, bless him. Uh, I'm actually in a pub. I'm in the Cross Keys pub in Hammersmith once more. It has a great uh, garden at the back. Uh, and is, is open sensible hours um, and I've also just got back from another party I've been tonight at the uh, the London Library which is in Mayfair uh, and the London Library is kind of a fascinating place in that it's a private library if you see what I mean you have to kind of join to be a member I think it actually dates back before public libraries became public libraries uh, but it's a kind of a groovy place um, and they have parties occasionally and in fact I'm going to get someone in from the London Library to talk to us uh, well just about what it's all about really and how it happened so tonight was very nice our new head ping pong is Helena Bonham Carter which is rather nice of her uh, and it's kind of also cool because there are sort of some of the greatest writers in the world have been members over the years so you're kind of standing on the shoulders of giants a little bit. So I met some lovely people tonight, some new friends, um, and actually not many old friends because I don't use the place very much. <laughs> I shall do more though. I shall do more because we just found out, uh, and I don't know when you're listening to this, my love, but it's, uh, it's the 1st of June uh, at the moment as I record this. This show will go out on the Saturday uh, in uh, uh, 2023, and we've just found out literally yesterday that we've got finance to take a brand new play to the Edinburgh Festival. Now, do your play at the Edinburgh Festival in June is leaving it a bit late, to be honest. You normally start planning the Edinburgh Festival. The Edinburgh Festival, by the way, is the, is the biggest open arts festival in the world, and it runs for all of August in Edinburgh, in Scotland. Most people start planning the August Festival the September before. So to be here sort of on the June before, i.e. two months, is a little bit... Well, how should we say? Seated the pants. But the show must go on, my loves. And we found out, as I say yesterday, that we've got the finance. So if you're going to be at the Edinburgh Festival, then please do get in touch, because I'm going to be up there for the whole month. We're also going to be doing the radio show from up there. And, of course, we will, uh, we'll be doing reviews on bohemianbritain.com. So drop me a line. Uh, you can get me still at uh, radio at mavericktheatre.co.uk radio at mavericktheatre.co.uk or you can now get me at the new address which is nick at bohemianbritain.com oh no nick at bohemianbritain.com i do sometimes spell bohemian wrong by accident but anyway you won't um and of course i invite you now to join in what i've got to do over the next three weeks is to knock up this script we've got a script from uh, the lovely robert lloyd george who of course is the great grandson of uh, the first world war uh, Prime Minister of uh, the United Kingdom, David Lloyd George, and we had a big uh, we had a big hit with his play uh, Winston and David about Winston Churchill and David Lloyd George last year. So this is kind of carrying on the partnership a little bit, but we've got a lot of editing to do on the script, and so I thought I'd share it with you. Here, oh, the script, yeah, it's called The Birth of Frankenstein, and it deals with, well, the birth of Frankenstein, basically. Frankenstein the novel, or um, Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus, as it was uh, called back in those days, in 1818, was written by Mary Shelley. It tells the story, of course, of Victor Frankenstein, a young scientist who creates this sort of sapient creature in an unorthodox, possibly illegal, who knows, uh, scientific experiment. Now, Shelley started writing the story after uh, when she was 18, and the first edition was published anonymously in London on the 1st of January 1818, when she was just 20 years old. Her name finally appeared in the second edition, which was published in Paris in 1821. And of course, it's just that horrible kind of, to our modern tastes, crazy situation. Well, I suppose not that old, really. J.K. Rowling called herself J.K. Rowling because she thought... Uh, you know, men were needed to write novels that children would read. Anyway, we won't go there now, but you know what I'm saying, don't you? Um, and so uh, this play is going to deal with the time when Mary Shelley and uh, her the, well, pre-husband, uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley, went away with Lord Byron 
to Switzerland. And it was during that weekend that Lord Byron apparently said, let's all write a ghost story. And this play that we're doing at the Edinburgh Festival is all about that situation. And so I'll invite you now to join in with my research for this <laughs> because uh, I came across this uh, rather interesting uh, piece. It's called Famous Monsters, sorry, Famous Monsters Speak. And this is Frankenstein Speaks. <laughs> yeah. I, I shouldn't do that, should I? Anyway, see what you think of this. I think it's rather good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are in the Great Hall of the Institute of Technology in Zurich, Switzerland. As you have already read in the newspapers, a most amazing discovery has been made in this most peaceful of countries. It seems that Dr. Victor Frankenstein, once thought to be a character in a story, did actually exist and created what we have come to call his monster. The purpose of this meeting today is to hear, for the first time, the actual voice of the monster. Strange as it may seem, Dr. Frankenstein made crude recordings of the monster's voice. The machine had to be rebuilt from Frankenstein's plans under the direction of Dr. Heinrich Eronius, the famed electronics engineer and dean of the university here. Many of the scientists <coughs> who have come today are convinced that this is a hoax, but are here only because of the reputation of Dr. Eronius. The machine stands before us on the stage. It's a huge thing looking something like a bad dream out of a science fiction story. Two speakers are on either side of it. The recordings themselves are now being brought in. They, uh, they look like oversized tape reels. A technician is now placing one on the machine. And Dr. Erroneous signals for silence. The lights are going down. The red indicator light on the machine has just gone on. And we are about to hear Frankenstein's monster speak for the first time. <sighs> so different from the little ones I see, the ones that scream and run from me. Strange to know why I frighten them, but not so strange to want to crush them, to feel them in my hands, to tighten my fingers and see them die. What is there about remembering? Can the little ones, the humans, Remember the night they came into the world. The monster can. There was darkness. All black. Cold. What did he make me from? From what grave did I come? Of what evil mixture was I compounded? In me the dead past of murderers comes to life. They have the strength of many men. Gave me life. Where is he? Where is Dr. 
Dr. Frankenstein. There's no place to hide, Dr. Frankenstein. No door to keep you from me. Not in here, Dr. Frankenstein. <laughs> No place is far from me. Me. Me! Yeah. Frankenstein, but I will come for you. I am your death, Dr. Frankenstein, your master. I have but one purpose, to end your life. Escape if you can, Dr. Frankenstein! What do you call your monster? You never gave me a name, but I have yours. I am called Frankenstein's monster. What a name you've added to the ghosts and the ghouls, the things that haunt and frighten, to the phantoms of the mind. But I, I am real. See? See? It hurts. I. I live. I speak. I hear my words. I am the monster tied to you forever. The hell that can only free you by giving you death. That's too easy for you. Too kind. Too gentle. While you live, you suffer. I see now that's my purpose, my only revenge. Frankenstein! I give you the gift of time, 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 time to understand the horror you've created. And for myself. I will amuse myself with terror and murder. That ends the first of what I can only call the tape recordings of the monster's voice. The, uh, the technicians are threading another spool into the machine and shortly we'll hear the second part of this amazing voice from the past. From the recordings, it's obvious that the monster has broken loose and is now free to rampage through the peaceful Swiss countryside. The... the doctor is signaling for silence. The machine started, and we are now going to hear again the innermost thoughts of Dr. Frankenstein's ghastly creation. I remember that night. I left your house, Frankenstein, and fear walked in front of me. Frighten mindless beasts. Lights, yes, lights and people, cozy and warm. A family, yes, together, warm and loving, touching. Mother, father, child touching, but not for me. Shall I wait until they sleep? Or is the horror twice as horrible when it comes out of nowhere? I trust! I break!
senseless, they called it. But it wasn't. There was reason, but enough to lead them to you, Dr. Frankenstein. What glory in killing if you cannot share in it. It's not an easy thing to be a monster, to be hated and feared, to be alone. Ah, but I'm not alone, am I? I have you, Dr. Frankenstein. I'm your child. Why do you step back from me? Come closer. Closer. <laughs> Too easy to tear you, to crush you, to trap you into the stone floor. I'm not good enough for you. Too quick, too simple. You must live as I live alone. Hated and hating. That's punishment. You tried to stop me, remember? So little faith in your own creation. But I stopped you. Did it hurt? Did you feel pain? I picked you up. Remember what power I felt to have your life in my hands. For a moment I was your judge, your jury, your executioner. But no, I didn't condemn you. Not then. I... If you died, what would I have to live for? What a weak, helpless thing you are. I saw you lying there, eyes half closed, making believe you were unconscious. <laughs> I knew you were watching, so I became your mindless monster again. second recording. There is an increasing air of uneasiness here in the hall. I notice that the lights have been turned up brightly and the scientists seem to have taken to looking behind them. The monster's terrifying indictment of Dr. Frankenstein is being taken seriously and there is a great deal of speculation about what is going to happen next. The tape is ready now. The lights have gone down just slightly. I put a hand over. 
over her mouth to stop the screams. I tried to calm her. I stroke her head so pretty, so soft. What can a monster love? Why couldn't she understand? I spoke to her. No. I told her how I felt. She wouldn't listen. She kept trying to scream. I didn't want to frighten her. No, no. She tried to get away. I couldn't help it. I tried to hold her. The life went out of her. I'm a monster, yes, but I wanted to undo what I had done. I want to see her moving and breathing again. And in this whole world, there was one man who could help me, you, Dr. Frankenstein. I was willing to give up all thoughts of revenge. If you could bring her back to life, I carried her back to you. I prayed that nothing would happen to you. I wanted you safe so that you could help me and bring her back to me. And then I would go away with her and never bother you again. Or hurt another human being again, a bargain. All I wanted was to make a bargain. And I forgot for that one little second of time who I was, what I was, and why I was alive. <sighs> didn't let me forget. I came back. I showed you the girl, and you called me fiend from hell. I begged, I pleaded, but you couldn't understand me. And in my concern for the girl I had killed, I let you strap me down. I thought you were going to help. So I went to this metal couch and let you put this machine on my head while she, she lay crumpled on the stone floor. Why, why do you hurt me this way? What is this thing on my head? Kill me now, Frankenstein, or I'll kill you. How long, how long must I endure this? Why do you look at me that way? That noise. Do you hear that, Frankenstein? People from the village, they come to find me, to destroy the monster. <laughs> and to kill the man that made it. I can save you, Frankenstein. Let me loose, and they won't hurt you. That's reserved for me. Let me up. What's that? Smell that. Untie me. They're burning the house. Let me go, Frankenstein. The fire. Come back. No. No. Not alone. Come back. Frankenstein. Come back. I wasn't made to die like this. Frankenstein, don't leave me to burn. Which one of us is the monster now? I will not die before you, Dr. Frankenstein. <sighs> Frankenstein think he's rid of me. But there's no place to hide from me. I'm your monster, and I'm coming for you. No matter where, no matter when. Change your name. Change your face. But I'll find you. No one. No one is safe from me. Ah. 
Anyway, there you go. Frankenstein speaks. Gripping stuff, isn't it? Um, and as I've mentioned at the start, the reason for playing that is that we're going to take a play called The Birth of Frankenstein to the Edinburgh Festival in August. We're going to be, for the first time, at the Pleasance. I don't know if you've been to the Edinburgh Festival. It's the world's biggest open arts festival. And for, for ooh, the last, I don't know, five or six years, I mean, you know, COVID aside, I've uh, stayed with the lovely Mervyn Stutter, who does a thing called Pick of the Fringe in Edinburgh every year. Um, and we've always been near the Pleasance Courtyard. And for the first time this year, we are with Pleasance. And we're going to be in the cellar at the Pleasance Courtyard. <laughs> and uh, as I say, there's a long way to go. Putting a show on in Edinburgh is a fairly massive task. It's almost a kind of a glorious agony. You know, it's one of those things that many people that go to Edinburgh, because it's so, so big now and so expensive and so full on. Many people go, yeah, I'm never going to do this again. And then they're back next year. And I suppose that's what we're going to do. So if you're going to be at the Edinburgh Festival, let me know. Or, of course, as always, if you've written anything, if you've got a book or uh, a poem, if you're involved in kind of you know, the arts or writing in any way, then do get in touch. Um, we should have a chat. you got a book coming out? Then let us know or let me know uh, and we'll have a chat about it. As always, uh, you can get in touch with radio at mavericktheatre.co.uk or nick at bohemianbritain.com which is our newish uh, website that this radio show also goes on nick at bohemianbritain.com uh, and it'd be great to hear from you in the meantime <coughs> i'm going to uh, set up my interview with the london library we'll have a chat with those people uh, and there's a, a marvelous actor from the pirates of the caribbean who's written a science fiction book which i've mentioned before kevin mcnally i'm going to have a chat with him soon as well uh, he doesn't know it yet. Well, he kind of does, but I, I should get in touch, shouldn't I? Um, and again, as I say, if there's anything that you're up to, then do please let me know. And that's all we've got time for. Thank you so much once again for your company. We are on bohemianbritain.com, but basically, I am Nick Hennigan. This is Literary London, and this is London's art station, Resonance 104.4 FM. <laughs> <laughs>